This is a new one on me. Um, yes, we've done a couple of booktube videos, uh, and I was talking to a couple of people. Connor being one of them, who said he's written some stuff before, and maybe he would like to publish one day. And I thought, as well as booktube, I may as well do author tube because I, I am an author. I've written two books, so I thought I would do. I think I've got an eight-part series on not only how I got my book from out of my head into Amazon, onto Kindle and onto paperback. Um, there's quite a lot of things I had to go through and learn along the way and I thought I may as well uh, share those experiences and if you did have a story inside you, and apparently everybody has a story inside them, what are you going to have to go through to get it into Amazon if you go down that route? These are the, the places you can do that. But if you're going to self-publish and you're not going to be lucky enough to be picked up by a publisher, there's, there's a lot you've got to learn and hopefully I can break down a lot of this. I don't know where we're heading with it. I've got eight points that I've, I'm going to start with and then I'm going to probably do one or two of them points in a little short video so you can watch them as you go. Then if you are any budding writers out there really want to give it a go, I'm not saying this is the best way of doing it. What I'm saying is this is what I did and having never read before and also never written anything before, had a dream, decided to write it down. Uh, it was a fairly steep learning curve for me. Luckily I'm in IT so that using Microsoft Word wasn't a problem and also my grammar was a problem. I got an E in English so I'm laying it all out there. <laughs> Not really author material. But the one thing that was important to me is that I did know how to use a computer, I did know how to type and when things were spelled wrong, generally Microsoft Word underlines them in red for you, which is really nice. The problem with me, uh, being borderline dyslexic, and when I was writing and it would underline in red, you right click on it, it generally tells you what that word is. Uh, I was spelling things that bad that it wouldn't have a clue still. So, so there's a lot of trial and error and changing vowels around until Microsoft Word became my friend again. So that's what I'm going to do. Hopefully you'll enjoy this. I'll try and keep them fairly short. Also, my yellow uh, thumbnails are going to be for booktube and my blue ones are going to be for the author side of things so if you see them pop up on twitter and you're not really that interested in the author ones then just click on the yellow ones and don't worry too much about the blue if you like them both fine okay as always if you subscribe and ring the bell especially if i'm doing a series because at least you'll get told and you'll be able to see all of these seven or eight videos that i put out there eight steps to becoming a fully published self-published author. It's currently eight steps. As we go through them it might be more than eight but currently it's going to be eight so that that might be eight videos it might be less because some of these steps are fairly short so I might mingle a couple of them together but there will be eight steps in total unless I add some. So I'm going to read them out first and then we're definitely going to cover the first one today. So I've talked too much about that I'm going to give you the other steps and then we're going to go back to step one. So first of all step one get out of your head get the book written. Step two, think about not getting an editor, then get an editor. Editors are worth their weight in gold. I think Stephen King once said to write is something and to edit is divine. Um, because editors are unbelievably talented and if you get a good one, they can, they can just turn your mad rambling into, into magic. And, and that's, that's what I did, so make sure you get an editor. Thirdly, I put get a good proofreader and you think, well, hang on a minute, no, I'm paying for an editor, why do I need a proofreader? They're totally different skills in my opinion. And the editor reshaped my book into five parts. I give her 60 chapters, I got back 47 chapters. She amalgamated a lot of the chapters. She, she made, move things around a little bit. She also did, did correct all of the grammar and, and made it make a lot more sense and she streamlined it and did an awful lot of things. But then after that, there was still the odd error in there and the proofreader will go through that with a fine tooth comb is it a different skill. Step four would be blurb, book cover, forward, beta readers, things like that. So we'll cover that when we get there. Step five is a step completely on Amazon KDP, Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing and specifically for the Kindle. So what do you need to do to get a Kindle book out there? Next step is Amazon KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. 
paperback. This is assuming you're doing it through Amazon, there isn't other ways, but I did it through Amazon, so I can only tell you what I did. Step seven is ACX Audible. That's Audible Creation Exchange. So get your audiobook out there. All of these you might think are gonna cost a lot of money. Tell you what, the last three steps, publishing on Kindle, publishing a paperback, and publishing on Audible cost zero, and that might shock you. So when we get there, we'll talk about why that costs zero. Then lastly, promote, promote, promote. You could have the best book in the world out there, um, but if no one's buying it, or no one sees it, or nobody, you haven't paid for any advertising, you don't get out there on your socials and, and start telling people that it's out there, then nobody's gonna read it. Okay, so get it out of your head, get an editor, talk about proofreading, blur, book cover, and all these sort of th other things that go with it, how it looks, I can't judge a book by its cover, but no one's gonna buy one unless it's got a decent one, I'll tell you that. Amazon Kindle, Amazon Paperback, Audible, and then promotion and getting it out there. First step then, so the first step to being an author, if you're willing to come on this journey, put in the comments, come on, I'm on this journey, Trev. I've got a story burning inside of me. So the first thing you've got to do, and don't worry too much about this. Don't worry about what people think. Don't make it over complicated. Just get the story out of your head. All right, so step one is get it down on a computer, out of your head, even if a lot of it's wrong, and just write, write, write. So first of all, open the computer. Don't think too much about your you have to have a bit of a plot. I dreamt of mine, so I'm very lucky. I dreamt seven dreams in one night. I wrote the bullet points down, so um, I knew where I was heading and then just started. But I'll tell you what I did do. Having never written nothing before in my life, I wrote 10,000 words before I got to bullet point number one. If you've read the book, top of the cliff is the first thing that I dreamt. There's an awful lot that happens before that. That's all made up but because I knew I had to get there, it, it just fl it flowed in my head. And I don't know how you're all gonna write because I can only speak for me, but what I did, I I'm dreaming it as I'm writing it. So as I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh, and then this would happen next. So I see it like a film in my head. So as I'm writing one chapter, I'm thinking, oh, and then he would do this, wouldn't he? Or then she would do that. So I'm generally, I'm not stuck at the end of a chapter going, what am I gonna write? I've all, because I'm seeing it like a film in my head, I, all, I already see the next chapter as if, oh, that, well, that's definitely going to happen next then. And because I know where I'm heading because I've made some bullet, pop bullet points, that's how I do it. The other thing I do is then bullet points I'll add to, and I keep them underneath the manuscript. So where we've got the manuscript and where I'm writing, underneath that, which is following me down the page, if you like, is all the bullet points. And as I clear one of those bullet points off, I highlight it a different colour so I know what's coming next. I don't always use them bullet points in that order either. I will sometimes just think, oh, hang on a minute, I can slide it in here. Okay, so that's me writing, just get the story out of your head and on paper. The other thing I do is I didn't know, because I, I've not read anything, um, I didn't know how speech was dealt with in a book. So I was sat there writing and then I realised that people are going to have to speak to each other. And I didn't, I, I, I wasn't sure what to do, so I, I did criticise J.K. Rowling, which probably is not great for me. Um, in her Harry Potter books where it says he said this, she said that, he said this, she said that. That's exactly what I thought you did. And my wife bought me a John Grisham book, which I've never read. Um, but what I did do, I grabbed hold of it, I was in a flat down London. I grabbed hold of this John Grisham book, and this is serious, and I, and I opened it and looked for when people were talking to each other and thought, how, how has John Grisham dealt with this? And then what I found out, and you're all going to laugh at people, then what I found out is, once you have established the two people who are talking, you then don't need to say who they are. You can just put the talking in because people are clever enough and brainy enough to realise that there's only two people in the room and one person finishes talking, the other person is then replying. So I didn't know you had to do that. I thought you always had to put he said, she said, like I was taught at school. Uh, and obviously that made things a lot easier. When three people end up in the conversation, you do have to put a bit more of that in. And sometimes you just put it in anywhere to give the, some context to how the person's saying something. So all of that, and as you all read, and it's probably only me in the world who's daft enough to write a book without reading, um, you probably won't have that issue. I did have that issue being a non-reader and had to work out how I'm gonna deal with uh, dialogue. I do think dialogue is the most important thing in the entire book though. I do talk about where the crowd have sing a lot and there's not a lot of dialogue in that but the, the descriptions of 
One thing I've learned from that is the how you can describe things a lot better than probably what I did in my first book. I think I did that a lot better in my second book. There's a scene in the second book in Funicular where there's a surfer and, and we're on the beach and you can nearly smell the sea. So I, I put a lot more effort in, into making sure that you, you, the reader, understood the surroundings during you could feel and smell and see everything that was going on. Because it's my job to do that to you, isn't it? It's my job to make sure that you can picture the scene too much of it sometimes is too much, but also not only picture the scene, also be able to understand who's seeing what at what time. All right, so yeah, uh, I put bullets un underneath my page, I suppose that's what I was getting at, and then if you don't have a series of dreams like I did, what you could then do is, to start, you must have an idea. So at least get a few things down there, and as you write, you'll think, oh, I could do that as well. So you can just add to that bulleted list, and that bulleted list will never end until the end of the book because you'll be adding to it and using it. Uh, that's how I do it. Okay. Nextly, edit as you go to get more descriptive. So again, I'm pouring the story out of my head. So I'm thinking, get it down, get it in Microsoft Word. I don't care if it makes sense right now. I don't care if it's grammatically correct. I'm not bothered. Get the story out of my head. Then what I'll do is every 10 chapters or so, I will then go back through it and then put a bit more descriptions in. So where I've got the story a bit like a skeleton story, it, it seems very good when I've written it, but when I read it back, I go, oh, you know, I haven't really explained what this person looks like, or, you know, he's got an annoying habit of flicking his hair, and, and I've, I've done it here, but when I first met him, it would have been better if I did that. Someone's already painted the picture of that person, and now I'm changing it, so I've got to be conscious of not playing with people's emotions. Um, and, and I edit as I go, so I would do that. Little tip for you. If you uh, got a Kindle, what I used to do was rather than reading Microsoft Word, which is quite hard, your Kindle has a Kindle email address. I'll do another video on this if you really want it. If you put in the comments that you want to see how to do it, I'll show you. I'll make a little video. You can go onto your Amazon account, you can get your Kindle email address. You can then send to your Kindle email, you, you, sorry, you add your email address into trusted emails in your Kindle, Amazon account in this Kindle area. Once you've done that, you can then send a Word document as an attachment to that email address and all you put in the title of the email is convert and it will convert that Word document into a Kindle and appear on your Kindle so you can read it and then, and then you know, it's a lot easier to read in the Kindle and fixing them in the Word document. So that's generally what I do. If you want to see a video on that, put in the comments below and I'll do you a little snippet of how you do that because it's really useful. It's also good if you want to send it to the a beta reader or you want a couple of your friends to read it before you then maybe get edited or something like that so you can send it to their kindles as well as long as you are in their trusted emails okay moving on so uh, edit as you go and get more descriptive with the editing and actually when i go back through it again i get even more descriptive then when i go through it again i get even more descriptive so i generally i will do the first 10 chapters go through it again then when i get to chapter 20 i'll actually go back to the beginning and do the whole thing again and then i'll i'll, I'll keep doing that so refining the process so at the end when you come to do your editing you've sort of already done it but your last final read through is more uh, isn't adding much it's more cleaning uh, that's how i do it anyway all right so the next one then is um microsoft word tips and tricks i'll probably do this in a separate video as well but you definitely want to look at your word count if you want to do a novel i think you've got to be over 50,000 words to be considered a novel but generally uh, between 70 and 100,000 is considered a novel. You'll have read a lot longer ones than that, but the, the, there also is um, a, a sweet spot for different genres. So if you've got a fantasy, I think that's a bit longer, about 120,000 is considered for a fantasy. If you've got a thriller, it's considered between 90 and 100, I think. Go Google it and you'll see that different genres have different sweet spots for publishers and they're, they're expected to be a certain length. You can book the trend, of course you can, and you can make them a lot longer. So I was expecting when I did 127,000 words for Room 119, I thought that was too many, but like I said, when it got edited, it, it just came under the, the, the 100,000 to about 93,000, which is around the sweet spot. So I accidentally hit it. In reality, my editor did that because she took all the, the garbage that I put in fixed it all up, didn't you? All right, so these are a few tricks in Word. Don't worry about your fonts, don't worry about your drop capitals, you know, them big capitals that you put at the front of words. All that can be done later on when you get your paper back ready. Just write it in a, in a consistent font and write it in a font that you can read and be happy with. You're not gonna get eye strain, you can be comfortable when you're on your computer. One more thing I would say though, 
is the use of italics. I didn't know this either, and it wasn't until it was edited and it came back that every time someone's thinking, it's put in italics. So when I was writing Funicular, obviously I did then put all the thinking bits in italics, and it really does help. It helps you when you're reading it, and it helps you as the author knowing that you've captured what people are thinking rather than saying sometimes. So, so things like that are in italics. There's a few other things that will be in italics as well. Uh, I think when, when I, if I had a note, I think in room 119 there's a note on a, written on a, on a beer mat, and I put that in italics, so it's, it's just to make it stand out a little bit more. I think I put that in its own section as well. So you can be quite funky with your formatting, but don't overdo it. Remember your readers like, read a lot of books and they're, they're used to form. They don't want you to be playing with them. I did see the other day somebody posted on, it's one of you YouTubers I was watching and said what was very bizarre about one of the books they've just read, it had no speech marks in it. It had none of them at all. So you had to sort of guess when people were talking. So obviously that's straight away the person was annoyed with that. They were going, well no, I'm not used to that. It's, it's breaking the rules. When you use your speech, your speech mark, do you use one or do you use two? And if it, whichever you do, you've got to be consistent. And I didn't do that. My editor went, well, what, what are you doing? Is it one or two? And I'll go, well, it's two, isn't it? Well, well, half of yours is one, half of it is two. We've got to be consistent. Don't muck around with the readers' heads, you know? So there's a few things I'll do in Word, and um, I'm a bit of an IT geek, so I'll probably show you a few things. I'll probably do that video when I'm showing you how to put drop capitals in for the format of the um, paperback rather than doing it now, but these, I'll talk in that video of stuff you should be doing now as well. I d definitely highlight things in yellow as well if I need to make sure that I have to remember something. So in the middle of writing chapter 20, I might think, oh, link this bit back to chapter four. Or if there's something written on a, a glass bottle, I'll say, go back to chapter four to get the exact writing or something like that. I'll always highlight them in yellow pen in, in Microsoft Word. And, and don't forget to take them back out. I think I told you a story where Stephen King left in, in brackets it said, please link this bit back to chapter two in Mr. Mercedes, one of the books I read. Um, so don't do that. But yeah, it is very useful. Don't stop what you're doing because you're in mid floor. Make a little note for yourself. Either use comments or just yellow highlighter pen and then a comment on top. Make sure you, you get rid of them when you've, once you fix the problem. Don't just keep saving on top of the same version, top of the same version, top of the same version. You've, you've been writing for four months, you've got one version, uh, your, your, your Mac or your computer goes pop, uh, and then it's gone. I generally save a version after any length of a sitting, and a version control, I'm a project manager as well, but okay. If you don't know how to version control, it goes version 0.1, then it goes version 0.2, version 0.3. When it gets to 10, it doesn't go to 1, it goes 11, 12, 30. So I think room 119 ended up on version 0.68 or something like that. So there's 68 different versions I had of room 119. The minute it's clean and ready to go to the editor, in my opinion, I baselined it at version 1.0, which meant that is a baseline version. All of them are the ones I can forget about. And that's what goes to the editor version 1.0. That's how I do it. That's how you should use version management. What the editor will then do is work on it and she'll send you it back as 1.1 because it's the baseline one, but now she's got a version of it. And then it'll be 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 as, as it bounces backwards between me and the editor. Then I got a proofreader involved. I think it ended up on version two then. And the eventual one I published was version three. Okay, but that didn't mean I had three versions. That means I had over 100 versions, but we had three baselines. So you don't have to be as mad as me with that, but make sure you do save it regularly as something else. And that if you haven't got another method, why not use that? All right, so that's getting the book out there. Get out of your head, uh, get yourself some bullets, get a, a direction you want to head in. There is other ways. Obviously, some people plan out the entire book before they even start writing and I'm sure other people do other things. I'm just telling you what I did. And if nothing else, if it inspires you to open your laptop and start typing, then the quicker you start typing and doing something, the quicker you'll type the end. And when you type the end, you've actually got something that could then be self-published and moved into the marketplace. I'm not gonna say you're gonna make thousands and thousands of pounds, but it's quite a cool thing having a book published. It's an even better thing when people like it. So the reviews you get after all that hard work 
really, really do make it. You, you feel quite proud of yourself whenever a review, a review comes in. You, you, when you get a bad one, I've not had many, but when you do get a bad one, it does ruin your day. But you know, you have a lot more highs than you have lows as long as it's any good, so make sure it's any good. Okay, good luck. If you like this video, please uh, subscribe, please click the like button, and if you're seriously considering doing any of this and writing your book, put in the comments about the ideas that you've got, I will pinch them, I promise, or maybe just put in the ideas if you're going to give it a go and ask me any questions. So if there's other questions you've got on, on that first bit we've covered, then please just ask me the questions on the bottom, I'll definitely answer them. Remember, everybody can do this differently, I'm just telling you what happened to me and I'd like to think it was fairly successful. I've sold quite a lot of books, I've got a lot of good reviews, so don't think I did everything wrong, well, I probably didn't do everything right, but the idea is if I tell you about some of the mistakes I made along the way as well, then that hopefully means you'll be able to go in there a bit more with an open mind and take some of the barriers, especially around Amazon, you know, you've got to give them tax numbers and things like that, so I'll try and give you some of the, the technical information that you'll need before you even attempt to do some of this stuff. All right, thanks a lot. See ya.